Greek mythology, love stories. The tale of Hero and Leander, love across the Hellespont. In the ancient city of Abydos, nestled along the shores of the Hellespont, a love story as timeless as the gods themselves unfolded. Hero, a priestess of Aphrodite, and Leander, a young man from the neighboring city of Sestos, found themselves entwined in a love that would defy distance, treacherous waters, and even the wrath of the god. Hero was the epitome of beauty, her raven black hair cascading like a waterfall, her eyes like deep pools of mystery, and her smile could light up the darkest night. She was dedicated to her duties as a priestess offering prayers and sacrifices to Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty, yet her heart longed for something more, something beyond the temple walls. Leander, on the other hand, was a skilled swimmer, his bronzed physique reflecting his devotion to the sea. He was known throughout Sistos for his strength and courage, but he felt that his life was incomplete, lacking a love as boundless as the sea itself. One fateful day, as the sun dipped below the horizon, Hero stood upon the temple's balcony, gazing across the glittering waters toward Sistos. She felt a strange sensation, as if someone were watching her. Little did she know, it was Lander, who from a distance had caught a glimpse of her radiant beauty and was instantly captivated. Leander's friends often told him tales of Hero, the enchanting priestess of Aphrodite. As he listened to their stories, he became determined to meet her, no matter the cost. His heart ached with a love that burned as fiercely as the sun's rays upon the water. One night, as the moon hung low in the sky, Leander decided to take action. He stripped off his clothes, revealing his muscular form, and with a heart full of determination, he dived into the Hellespont's chilly waters. The journey across the strait was treacherous, with strong currents and unpredictable tides, but Leander was undeterred. Each stroke brought him closer to his beloved hero. As Leander swam, he couldn't help but think of Hero's radiant smile and the warmth he imagined he would find in her arms. The thought of her kept him strong, pushing him forward through the dark waters. The gods themselves seemed to watch over him that night, guiding his way. Hero, meanwhile, continued to gaze out at the sea, yearning for something she couldn't quite name. It was then that she spotted a distant figure in the water, moving steadily toward the shore. As the figure drew closer, she realized with astonishment that it was a man, swimming toward her temple. Leander finally reached the shores of Abydos, exhausted but exhilarated. He climbed out of the water and found himself standing before the temple of Aphrodite. Hero, unable to contain her curiosity, any longer rushed down to the shore to meet him. Their eyes locked, and in that moment, they knew they were destined to be together. The two lovers spent blissful days and nights in each other's arms, their love growing stronger with each passing moment. Yet, as with all great love stories, challenges lay ahead. Leander knew that he would have to return to Sestos eventually, but he vowed to make the perilous journey across the Hellespont to see Hero whenever he could. Their love flourished despite the odds, as Hero would light a lantern in the tallest tower of the temple each night, guiding Leander safely through the dark waters. He would swim to her eagerly, and their love would burn brightly, like a beacon of hope in the night. However, fate can be cruel, and the gods often test the love of mortals. One stormy night, as Leander made his way to Hero, the winds howled and the waves roared in anger. The sea turned treacherous, and the lantern's light flickered and went out. Leander, disoriented in the darkness, struggled to find his way. Hero, realizing that the lantern had gone out, feared the worst. She rushed to the shore, calling out Leander's name, but there was no answer. Desperate to save her beloved, she jumped into the churning sea, hoping to swim to him. The gods looked down upon the star-crossed lovers, their hearts filled with pity and admiration. In a divine act of compassion, they transformed Hero and Leander into two celestial bodies, forever destined to be together. Hero became a radiant star in the night sky, and Leander became a constellation of his own forever reaching out to his beloved. And so, the love of Hero and Leander transcended the mortal world, becoming a symbol of the power of love to overcome even the greatest of obstacles. Their story served as a reminder to all that true love, like the sea itself, is boundless and eternal, a force that can never be extinguished, even by the gods.
the sculptors love, Pygmalion and Galatea. In the ancient city of Cyprus, amidst the lush vineyards and azure seas, there lived a gifted sculptor named Pygmalion. He was renowned throughout the land for his exquisite craftsmanship, but despite his skill, he was a man of solitary disposition. His heart, dedicated solely to his art, remained untouched by the amorous desires that consumed others. Yet his world was about to be transformed by the most beautiful creation he had ever conceived. One day, as Pygmalion wandered through the bustling marketplace, he couldn't help but notice the joyful celebrations of Aphrodite's festival that had enveloped the city. The people were adorned in flowers and laughter, celebrating the goddess of love and beauty. Although he admired the works of art and the merriment around him, Pygmalion remained an observer, a silent spectator of life's passions. That night, he returned to his humble studio, where marble dust hung heavy in the air. His latest project, a lifelike statue of a woman, stood in the center of the room. He had been working on it for months, and it was his most ambitious creation yet. The statue was carved with such precision and artistry that it seemed as though it might come to life at any moment. As Pygmalion gazed upon his masterpiece, his heart stirred with a longing he had never experienced before. He had sculpted the statue with such devotion that he had poured his own desires and dreams into it. He realized that in the image of this beautiful woman, he had unwittingly created the perfect embodiment of his ideal love. Night after night, he sat before the statue, speaking to it as if it were a living being. He confessed his deepest emotions, his unspoken desires, and his overwhelming love for the marble woman he had named Galatea. He offered her gifts of fragrant flowers and delicate jewelry, hoping that the goddess of love herself would hear his pleas and grant his wish for her to come to life. Aphrodite, the divine patron of love, had indeed heard Pygmalion's fervent prayers. Touched by his unwavering devotion, she decided to grant his wish. On the night of the festival of Aphrodite, as Pygmalion lay asleep in his studio, the goddess descended from Mount Olympus and stood before the statue of Galatea. With a gentle touch, Aphrodite breathed life into the cold, unfeeling marble. Galatea's eyes flickered open, and she blinked in astonishment. Her body, once rigid and unmoving, now flowed with warmth and vitality. She looked at her surroundings, her gaze eventually falling upon the man who had lovingly sculpted her. As Galatea's eyes met Pygmalion's, a spark of recognition and affection ignited within her. She smiled, and in that moment, Pygmalion realized that his deepest wish had been granted. The statue he had poured his heart and soul into was no longer an inanimate object. It was a living, breathing woman. Overwhelmed with joy and disbelief, Pygmalion rushed to embrace Galatea. They held each other tightly, their hearts beating in unison. It was a love story, unlike any other, a union of art and life brought together by the benevolence of a goddess. As the days turned into weeks, Pygmalion and Galatea's love flourished. They explored the island of Cyprus together, reveling in the beauty of the world around them. Galatea was a quick learner, eager to experience the wonders of life as a mortal. Pygmalion, in turn, was captivated by her innocence, her curiosity, and her boundless capacity for love. News of Pygmalion's miraculous love story soon spread throughout the city, and people came from far and wide to witness the living embodiment of his artistry. They marveled at the beauty of Galatea and the depth of love between the sculptor and his creation. It was a love that surpassed even the most passionate mortal unions. However, as the years passed, Pygmalion and Galatea faced a dilemma. They were both aware that Galatea's immortality was a gift from the goddess. And one day, Aphrodite might choose to take it back. The couple grew increasingly anxious, fearing the day when they might be separated forever. One evening, under the soft glow of the moon, Pygmalion and Galatea knelt before an altar dedicated to Aphrodite. They offered heartfelt prayers, 
expressing their gratitude for the love they had shared and their hope that it would endure, even if Galatea were to return to her lifeless form. Moved by their devotion and love for each other, Aphrodite appeared before them once more. She smiled upon the couple and, with a touch of her divine hand, transformed Galatea into a statue once more. Yet, this time, the statue was not lifeless. It was imbued with a warm, eternal glow. Galatea remained a beautiful statue, forever in the prime of her youth, her love for Pygmalion frozen in time. The sculptor continued to visit her, sharing his thoughts, his dreams, and his unending love. He knew that, in her immortal form, they would never be separated again, and their love would endure for all eternity. And so, the story of Pygmalion and Galatea became a legend, a testament to the power of love, art, and the benevolence of the gods. Their love transcended the boundaries of mortality, and in the heart of the ancient city of Cyprus, the sculptor's masterpiece stood as a symbol of a love that would never fade, a love that had been touched by the divine. Eros and Psyche, a love beyond measure. In the realms of ancient Greece, amidst the grandeur of Mount Olympus and the beauty of the mortal world, there lived two souls destined to be entwined in an extraordinary tale of love, betrayal, and redemption. Eros, the god of love, and Psyche, a mortal of unparalleled beauty. Psyche was born to a king and queen whose splendor rivaled even the gods. Her beauty was said to eclipse that of Aphrodite herself, the goddess of love and beauty. People from distant lands flocked to glimpse the radiant mortal, their admiration reaching such heights that they began to worship her as if she were a goddess reborn. Aphrodite, upon hearing of this mortal who dared to challenge her supremacy, grew wrathful. She could not abide the idea of Psyche's beauty being placed above her own. Determined to humble the young mortal, Aphrodite summoned her son, Eros, the god of love, and gave him a daunting task. Take your golden arrows, dear son, she instructed, and use them to make Psyche fall in love with the most vile and repugnant creature on earth. She must know the misery of loving someone so grotesque. Eros, a mischievous yet tender-hearted god, was conflicted. He had seen Psyche from afar and had been captivated by her beauty himself. However, he could not refuse his mother's command, and so he set out to fulfill her wishes. On a moonlit night, Eros descended to the mortal realm, his golden arrows in hand, as he stood above the sleeping Psyche, ready to pierce her heart. He was struck by her innocence and vulnerability. He could not bring himself to carry out his mother's cruel request. Instead, he pricked himself with one of his own arrows, falling hopelessly in love with the mortal he was meant to curse. In that moment, Eros knew that he could not harm Psyche, and so he fled, leaving her untouched. As time passed, Psyche's beauty remained unparalleled, and her suitors grew increasingly desperate. But to her parents' dismay, she remained unwed. In a cruel twist of fate, they consulted the oracle of Apollo, who delivered a chilling prophecy. Psyche shall marry a creature neither mortal nor god. He shall come to her in darkness, and she shall know neither joy nor sorrow until she beholds him. The king and queen, grief, stricken by the prophecy, followed its instructions. They dressed Psyche in funeral attire and led her to the edge of a great cliff, where she was left alone to await her grim fate. As Psyche stood trembling on the precipice, Zephyr, the gentle west wind, carried her away from the brink and set her down gently in a hidden, enchanting valley. There, amidst blooming flowers and singing birds, Psyche discovered a magnificent palace, the likes of which she had never seen. It was a place of wonder and beauty, where every need was catered to by invisible hands. In this paradise, Psyche lived a life of solitude, her only companions being disembodied voices 
and a loving yet mysterious husband who visited her only under the cover of darkness. Her days were filled with riches and pleasures, but she longed to see the face of her beloved husband, to know the identity of the one who had saved her from certain doom. One night, unable to bear the secrecy any longer, Psyche resolved to uncover the truth. She lit a lamp and crept into her husband's room, expecting to find a hideous monster as foretold by the oracle. To her astonishment, she beheld the face of a god, a young and impossibly handsome man with golden wings, his true identity revealed as Eros. Startled by the light and the knowledge that Psyche now possessed, Eros fled from her, his heart heavy with sorrow. He returned to Mount Olympus and sought counsel from his mother, Aphrodite, who, fueled by jealousy, was eager to punish Psyche for discovering her son's true nature. Aphrodite devised a series of impossible tasks for Psyche, determined to prove her unworthiness. She demanded that Psyche sort a mountain of mixed grains, collect a handful of golden fleece from fierce rams, and retrieve a flask of water from the river Styx, each task more treacherous than the last. With unwavering determination, Psyche embarked on her quest. Miraculously, she received help from unexpected sources. Ants aided her in sorting the grains, reeds instructed her on how to gather the fleece, and an eagle assisted her in collecting the water from the river Styx. With each task, Psyche's strength and determination grew. Her beauty, though ethereal, paled in comparison to her courage and resourcefulness. However, as she completed her final task, retrieving the flask of water from the underworld, Psyche could not contain her longing to reunite with Eros. Driven by love, she opened the flask of water, hoping that its divine contents would grant her the strength to overcome the obstacles that lay ahead. Instead, she was consumed by a death-like slumber, her body falling to the ground, unconscious. Eros, tormented by his separation from Psyche, could no longer bear to be apart from her. He descended to the mortal realm once more, found Psyche's lifeless body, and kissed her tenderly. As his lips touched hers, Psyche awoke, her eyes filling with tears of joy and love. Eros, knowing that they could never be together as long as Aphrodite's jealousy endured, pleaded with Zeus, the king of the gods, to intervene. Zeus, moved by the depth of their love, summoned Aphrodite and commanded her to cease her torment of Psyche. Aphrodite, though, begrudgingly, agreed to the king of the gods' decree. Eros and Psyche were reunited, and Zeus himself blessed their union, making Psyche immortal, so that she could dwell eternally with her beloved Eros. And so, the love story of Eros and Psyche became a testament to the power of love to overcome adversity, to defy even the will of the gods. Their love was tested, and through their trials and tribulations, it emerged stronger and more enduring than any mortal or deity could comprehend. It became a love beyond measure, a love that would be celebrated and cherished for all eternity, transcending the boundaries of mortal and divine. Iphis and Ianthe, Love Beyond Gender In the heart of ancient Greece, within the flourishing city of Delphi, lived a couple whose love story defied societal norms and challenged the very nature of destiny. Iphis, born a girl, and Ianthe, her beloved, navigated the tumultuous seas of love, identity, and acceptance in a world governed by tradition and expectation. Iphis was born into a family of humble means, but her parents were devout followers of the goddess Isis, known for her power to change fate and alter one's destiny. When Iphis was born, her mother prayed fervently to Isis, beseeching her to change the course of her daughter's life. In response, the goddess granted the child a unique gift, a male identity. From that day forward, Iphis was raised as a boy. As Iphis grew, her parents concealed her true identity, going to great lengths to ensure that no one ever discovered the secret they held so dearly. 
She was taught the skills and knowledge expected of a boy, her parents believing that this was the only way to secure her future and provide her with the opportunities that were denied to women in their society. Meanwhile, in the same city of Delphi, there lived a girl named Ianthe. She was the epitome of beauty, with golden hair that gleamed like the sun and eyes as radiant as the moon. Ianthe's grace and charm were renowned throughout the region, and many sought her hand in marriage. Yet, despite the many suitors who pursued her, she had not found love in her heart for any of them. One fateful day, as Ianthe visited the local marketplace, she caught a glimpse of Iphis. He had grown into a handsome young man, his strength and character evident in his bearing. Their eyes met, and in that moment, something shifted within both of them. It was as if their souls recognized each other, as if they had been fated to meet. Ianthe's heart swelled with emotions she had never experienced before, and she knew that she could not let this chance encounter slip away. She approached Iphis, and their conversation flowed effortlessly, as if they had known each other for a lifetime. They shared stories, dreams, and secrets. And as the sun dipped below the horizon, they parted with promises to meet again. As days turned into weeks, Iphis and Ianthe's love blossomed, transcending the boundaries of gender and societal expectations. They met in secret, their stolen moments together, a source of solace and happiness. In each other's arms, they found the acceptance and understanding that had eluded them in the world outside. But their love story was not without its challenges. Iphis was haunted by the knowledge that, in truth, she was not the man Anthe believed her to be. The weight of her secret grew heavier with each passing day, threatening to unravel the love they had fought so hard to build. Desperate to find a solution, Iphis confided in her father, revealing the truth of her birth and the goddess Isis's intervention. Her father, torn between his love for his child and fear for her future, sought counsel from the Oracle of Delphi. The Oracle's words were clear. Iphis and Ianthe could only be together if the goddess Isis herself granted her blessing. Determined to be with the one she loved, Iphis embarked on a pilgrimage to the Temple of Isis. She prayed fervently, offering sacrifices and pleading for the goddess's intervention. Her devotion moved the heavens, and Isis appeared before her, her divine presence filling the temple. Iphis, the goddess spoke, your love for Ianthe is pure and true, your heart is sincere, and you have faced great adversity for the sake of your love. I grant you this boon. Your true form shall be revealed to Ianthe on your wedding day. Until then, your love shall remain steadfast, and your bond shall be unbreakable. With the goddess's blessing, Iphis returned to Delphi, her heart filled with hope and anticipation. She and Ianthe made plans for their wedding, knowing that their love would endure whatever challenges lay ahead. As the day of their wedding approached, the entire city of Delphi buzzed with excitement. The union of Iphis and Ianthe was celebrated as a symbol of love's triumph over adversity, and people came from far and wide to witness their vows. On the day of the wedding, the couple stood before their friends, family, and the entire community. The moment had arrived when the goddess's blessing would be fulfilled, as Iphis and Ianthe exchanged their vows and sealed their love with a kiss. A miracle unfolded. Before the eyes of all who had gathered, Iphis's form began to change. Her male appearance melted away like the morning mist, revealing her true self, the woman she had always been. The crowd gasped in astonishment, and Ianthe, though surprised, gazed upon her beloved with a love that transcended appearances. Their love story had defied the constraints of society, challenged the boundaries of gender, and earned the blessing of a goddess. Iphis and Ianthe's love was a testament to the power of love to overcome adversity, to see beyond the external and embrace the true essence of a person's soul. In the years that followed, Iphis and Ianthe continued to live a life filled with love and happiness. Their love story became a legend, celebrated throughout Greece and beyond as a symbol of love's ability to triumph over any obstacle, to transcend the limits of convention, 
and to embrace the beauty of the human soul. The Race of Love, Atalanta and Hippomenes. In the lush hills of ancient Greece, there lived a huntress of unparalleled speed and skill named Atalanta. Her beauty was as captivating as her swiftness, and her heart was as untamed as the wilderness she roamed. Men from far and wide sought her hand in marriage, but she had a challenge for anyone who wished to win her love, a race to the death. Atalanta had made a vow to the goddess Artemis, the guardian of the hunt, to remain unmarried and devote her life to the chase. She knew that any man who hoped to claim her as his bride must first beat her in a foot race. With a grim twist, those who lost would meet their end at the jaws of a fierce Caledonian boar. Many had tried and many had failed. Among the eager suitors was a young man named Hippomenes, whose path had crossed with Atalanta's at the grand feast of the gods. He was struck by her beauty and courage and became determined to win her heart, even if it meant risking his life in the perilous race. Hippomenes sought the guidance of the goddess Aphrodite, the deity of love and desire, who was known for her cunning ways. He prayed fervently to her, and in response, Aphrodite appeared before him. She offered him three irresistible golden apples from her sacred tree, each infused with her divine power. These apples, Aphrodite whispered, will be your secret weapons in the race against Atalanta. Use them wisely, and she will be yours. Confident in the goddess's gift, Hippomenes made his way to the race course, where a crowd had gathered to witness the outcome of this audacious challenge. Atalanta stood at the starting line, her athletic form poised and ready, her eyes filled with a fierce determination. As the race commenced, Atalanta's nimble feet carried her forward with astonishing speed. She left Hippomenes trailing behind, his breath labored as he struggled to keep pace. The crowd watched in anticipation, fully expecting Atalanta to claim yet another victory. However, Hippomenes had a plan. With the first golden apple in hand, he rolled it ahead of him, and its radiant glow caught Atalanta's eye. The apple, a symbol of desire and temptation, was irresistible, and she paused to pick it up. As she admired its beauty, Hippomene surged ahead, gaining a precious lead. Atalanta, undeterred by the momentary delay, soon overtook him. Hippomenes, however, was ready. He rolled the second golden apple, and again, Atalanta's curiosity got the better of her. She stopped to pick it up, allowing Hippomenes to regain the lead. The race continued in this manner, with Hippomenes strategically using the apples to slow Atalanta's progress and maintain his advantage. The crowd watched in awe as the two competitors pushed themselves to the limits of their endurance, their fates hanging in the balance. As they neared the finish line, Hippomenes knew he had to save the final apple for the most critical moment. With Atalanta closing in, he rolled the last golden apple ahead of him, and this time, the temptation proved irresistible. Atalanta hesitated, torn between her desire for the apple and her determination to win the race. In that fleeting moment, Hippomenes surged ahead and crossed the finish line, victorious. The crowd erupted in cheers and applause, and Atalanta, though defeated, had a smile on her face. She recognized the cleverness and bravery of the man who had won her heart. Hippomenes approached Atalanta, and the two exchanged words of admiration and respect. They knew that their love had been sealed not only by a race, but also by the challenges they had faced together. Their hearts were entwined, and they pledged themselves to each other in love and devotion. As Atalanta and Hippomenes prepared to wed, they knew that their love story had defied convention and expectation. They had overcome a seemingly insurmountable obstacle, thanks to the divine intervention of Aphrodite and the cunning use of the golden apples. Their love was a testament to the power of love itself the strength of human determination, and the enduring legacy of those who dared to challenge fate. In the years that followed, Atalanta and Hippomenes lived a life filled with love 
adventure, and the boundless beauty of the world. Their story became a legend, celebrated throughout Greece as a symbol of love's ability to conquer even the most formidable challenges. It served as a reminder that in matters of the heart, love itself can be the greatest force of all, capable of transcending any obstacle, no matter how daunting. Thank you for watching. If you like this kind of video, please hit the subscribe button and click the notification bell to get notified whenever we post a new video.